We are people of the 21st century, far removed from the upper room. We've put away the festive trumpets, the fancy clothes, and the chocolate Easter bunnies from last week. But must the message of Easter be put away for another year? We still seek the one who offers victory over death, whose love conquers evil, and unlocks the doors that prevent us from discovering our true selves. We are an Easter people, driven not by fear, but by love. So together, let's worship the risen Christ who offers us new life. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I would be blessed if you would join your heart with mine in prayer. Death-defying God, just as you raised Jesus out of the shadows and fears of that lonely grave, so you come to call us from the fears which surround us, to fling open the doors of our hearts which have been locked by this pandemic. Risen and victorious Christ, locked doors and sealed tombs could not keep you from being with the ones you loved. You stood in the middle of your friends, in the very place where they huddled in worry and fear on that first night of Easter. Even as you stood in their midst, come among us now, wherever we find ourselves on this day of our lives to remind us that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can keep us from our life in you. Send your spirit of peace to strengthen us with your gentle grace, so we may dare to be present with all whose lives are scarred by fear. To serve all who today need grief-shattered hearts mended, 
to breathe peace and life into everyone we meet this day and every day. Now, divine friend, as you draw us close to your heart, which is our true home, we join our hearts and voices, praying together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Out of the stale darkness he rises into the light. Bright rays of sun split the top of trees. Clouds depart. And blue fills sky. The smell of angels lingers in the air. His hair feels the cool breeze once again. This was not the garden. But a new world, made from the eruption of hope and a life that could not be held down. We were witnesses to the life that rose from the dead. God's relentless love comes close to us, moving stones from tombs, opening the heart to a new possibility. Death no longer stands. races inside my chest as I step forward into the future, my future. I grasp it with open hands, with a new naivety, a child toward a mother, to be held and lifted up and cradled with care. At times I hesitate, I grasp on to memories of what once was, but I know that I'm not alone in my apprehension. I feel the hands of others holding me. These are my sisters, my brothers, who are not strangers to my fears and frailties, who can feel their own scars, both fresh and old, who have also confronted a hope that frightens them. They step in pace with me. Weeping women at the graveside, the scared disciples in the upper room. This is our future, where we walk together toward our new home, built from the hands of a wounded king, the new Zion, forsaking kingdoms marked by borders and divides, where all our settlements are but temporary shelters, sanctuaries of rest for the wounded and weary. And the Christ returns to visit us as Galilee's boats pull to shore. These places seem familiar. The lapping water, the sand. But we are not to return to these lands, nor are those dreams, but become pilgrims to set our belongings in a new home, to wash our sandy feet in some other place lay down our tired souls on a distant promise, quilted from both the today and the tomorrow. And we dine as a day sees another setting sun, sitting across the table from one another, seeing each sweet face, laughing deeply, feeling whole once more. And we see the Savior smile. 
knows our journey's end. And he pours us another cup, full of his love. And this time, our eyes tell him that we understand. Today's scripture reading is John 20, verses 19 to 31. I invite you to listen with your hearts as well as your ears. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Will you pray with me? Day by day, day by day, dear Lord of you, three things we pray. To see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Well, on this second Sunday of Eastertide, I thought I would begin today's message by doing a little experiment. And 
because we're not meeting in person yet, I don't have the luxury or the benefit of having willing volunteers to participate or people to watch their response or their reaction to this experiment. But it's really not for me anyway, it's for you. Uh, so even under these conditions, it should still do the trick. So are you ready? Christ is risen. I said, Christ is risen. Well, I said, Christ is risen. Hmm. Did you do it? Did you? Did you? <laughs> did you? say it out loud or did you stuff it down and not say it? You know the answer, right? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. How many times have we heard and rehearsed and practiced that one little liturgical piece throughout the years? It may be one of the most familiar liturgical responses that we have that's familiar to most people, uh, like Palm Sunday, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Even if we don't even know what Hosanna really means, we say it because it's Palm Sunday and we're supposed to say that stuff. And then Easter morning, Christ is risen. And the congregation responds, Christ is risen indeed. It, it really wouldn't be Easter without it, right? But I'm wondering if you responded, You know, it reminds me of a really interesting, cute story um, about a pastor who was visiting a church, filling in for the regular pastor, and was leading worship. And before the service started, one of the deacons pulled that pastor aside and said, there's just a couple things you need to know. Okay. First of all, pastor always starts the service by saying, the Lord be with you. And then the congregation has an opportunity to respond. The pastor says, oh, that's no problem. I do that all the time. No sweat. So pastor walks up to the lectern, smiles at the congregation. They smile back. And he opens his mouth and says, the Lord the Lord, and it doesn't sound right. So he blows in the microphone, can't hear anything. So he looks around and he says, there's something wrong with this microphone. And the congregation responds, and also with you. <laughs> that, I love that story. But the responsiveness of those familiar phrases Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, the Lord be with you, and also with you. They're a part of our, our worship experience. But like I said earlier, I wonder how strange it feels for you to be watching this digitally on a computer or on your television screen, maybe by yourself or with a loved one close by, knowing that it's not the same as being together in the house of worship that we know and love. Ordinarily, you would participate in the way that you typically participate. You would respond in the responsive call to worship and you would pray the prayer that's printed in the bulletin maybe, sing hymns that are familiar to you. But in this strange situation, are you singing the hymns or just listening? Are you actually praying out loud the prayers with me that are printed on the screen or just listening? There's no right or wrong. 
there's no judgment being cast. I'm just curious because when I watch these services with my wife, not only is it really bizarre to see myself doing this because I'm my worst critic, but I feel awkward just telling the truth that when it comes time to pray the prayer, I've already prayed it, making the recording. I already came up with the prayer to share. So it's not like I don't know what I'm doing, but there's this, this moment where I have to make the decision of whether or not I'm going to say it out loud with myself on the screen or whether I'm just going to let me do it for me. And I, I haven't talked with my wife about this, but I'm sure that it's awkward for her too. Now, I will say I have caught her saying the Lord's Prayer with me. Um, but again, that's our experience, my experience. I would love to know whether you responded to the Christ is risen or if you are participating in these online worship experiences. The reason it's important is because through the centuries, the liturgy of the church has progressively become less participatory for the people and more of an experience of, of just observing. Again, other than doing what's printed in the bulletin, there's a sense of separation between what happens up front with the pastor and what happens in the, in the pew or in the sanctuary. And that's a long historical thing that, that isn't easily resolved. Uh, but over time, our liturgy has become more of a, of a separation where the pastor stands up in front of the congregation and kind of does the worship for them. And the congregation becomes more of, a, of a, um, an idle observer rather than participant. And it's really hard to fix that because it's not so much the words on the page or the prayers that are prayed, or even the music, that the hymns that we sing. It's more a matter of what a person brings in their soul, in their spirit to a time of worship. And our reluctance, our hesitation to let go and fully participate in a moment of worship when we're by ourselves it reveals that awkwardness and vulnerability that we do find safety in numbers. That I will say something out loud with other people, as long as they're saying the same thing that I will for myself, by myself. And maybe that's because there's nobody to hide behind. That if I hear myself say those words, pray those prayers, make these proclamations, there's a sense of ownership. And I don't know if I'm truly ready to own what I'm saying because no one else is covering for me. And if our liturgy and our worship is idle like that or dry or sterile, whatever word you want to use, then how do we respond to this message of resurrection? Most people know the drill. The story doesn't change from year to year, does it? Same story, maybe a different gospel reading, but it's the same story. How many different ways can you say Christ is risen? But it's not the resurrection itself that is of ultimate importance. The gospel writers are not the least bit interested in explaining how the resurrection happened. Not at all. They are overwhelmingly committed 
to investigating and declaring the how about the resurrection. Not the fact itself historically, but the response of people who encountered that message. That is timeless. That has always been and continues to be the number one challenge. How do we translate the power of a resurrection message into our own everyday life? That it's not just about victory over physical death. I mean, that's great and all, but if we don't incorporate it in a significant way here, then it loses its real power because it's not intended to put us into a place where it's, it's about looking into the future and it's all about what happens after we die. It's about how can we effectively transform the quality of our lives in the here and now with this incredible message that was given to Mary, a message that she sent and passed on to his disciples. He wasn't where I thought he would be. He wasn't even where he should have been. And when he talked to me, he told me, go tell my sisters and brothers that I've gone ahead of them. An incredible message. And yet, we struggle to find ways to incorporate it in intimate ways. That's why this morning's story from John's Gospel is so powerful and beautiful. It is. And I'll even give you a little tidbit of biblical trivia that you can impress your friends and neighbors with. John 20, verses 19 to 31, is the only biblical passage that appears every single year on the Sunday following Easter in the Common Lectionary. Otherwise, it's all changed up year after year, different readings. But John 20, 19 to 31, every single year. Now, the people who put the lectionary together are sending a message about this passage from today. We hear it every year. It must mean there's an importance to this message that we have to continuously convey to ourselves and one another that there's a truth or a reality that we have to be living into and not just be casual bystanders or observers. This is an invitation for us to become participants. Look at Thomas. According to the story, Thomas was not with his friends and the other disciples on that first night of Easter. They were all huddled together in a locked room because they were terrified of what the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities would do to them if they got caught. Don't forget, once the news is out that Jesus' body was gone, the rumor mill, especially the politicians and the religious people who thought they had it all fixed and taken care of, now they have to spin the story so that the disciples stole his body so that now he can be a hero. And if they will do that to Jesus, what they did to him, then they're gonna, they can do that to us. So we can understand why they're all huddled together with the doors locked. But where's Thomas? We don't know. John doesn't tell us where Thomas was, what he was up to, what kind of trouble he was into, or what kind of trouble he was avoiding. We just know that the community of faith in that locked room was incomplete. While these disciples are huddled in this room and Thomas is out doing whatever Thomas was doing, suddenly the risen Christ appears through the locked doors and is standing right in their midst. 
and he offers them this incredible blessing of peace. He blesses them. And there had to be a few after the initial shock of the moment who thought, oh, poor Thomas, poor Thomas. How could he miss out on this? How are we going to tell him? How are we going to explain this to him? Well, fortunately, the story doesn't end there. Thomas, the next time Jesus shows up, Thomas is with them. And when they declare to him that he is risen from the dead, you know what Thomas says, right? It's what gives him the moniker of being doubting Thomas, which I think is a cheap shot. Uh, he deserves more love than that. But he says, unless I see and touch the wounds, the scars in his hands and his feet, and put my hand into the wound in his side, I will not believe it. Well, thank goodness the story doesn't end there either. The risen Christ, this is so powerful, comes to Thomas and says, put your finger into these holes in my hand. Place your hand into my side. Touch the wounds on my feet where the nails pierced me. And Thomas declares my Lord and my God. He believes. Thomas is being invited by the risen Christ into a profoundly intimate encounter. It, don't just be a bystander, Thomas. Touch the wounds. Feel the scars. Be in touch with what is holy. And according to the story, Thomas is the first one who gets to touch Jesus. He told Mary, don't touch me because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But Thomas, touch, touch these. Place your finger in. There is nothing more profoundly emotional and intimate than that touch. And to reach out and touch the wounds of another. I find it fascinating that the risen Christ shows up wounded. I mean, in a perfect world, all the scars and all the wounds and all the bleeding and all the gory stuff would magically disappear. But it doesn't. The risen Christ appears among them with the wounds of his execution. And the reason for that, I believe, is because we have got to have the courage. If we're going to have a faith that is spiritually engaging and meaningful in our lives, then we have to be willing to touch the scars. Not only our own, but the wounds and the scars of others. The only way that Jesus could possibly demonstrate and proclaim his victory, it wasn't just a victory over death, but a victory over what had been done to him by other human beings. That he not only conquers death, but he conquers his wounds, his scars. Ah, there, there's something incredible about that that it reaches out and it sh just kind of grab you and shake you. And it's like, oh my gosh. The victory that Jesus proclaims and embodies is more than just something that happens on a page. It's something that convicts us and empowers us to claim victory after victory, not just over the simple things in our lives, but over our own wounds and our scars. Those things that, that, that have harmed us in our life. And we all have a list. Scars come with stories. 
I have a scar right here next to my eye. Got it in first grade. I remember the moment like it was yesterday. I was the smallest kid in the room and I don't remember why we were doing it, but I remember being chased around the classroom by somebody and I slipped and I fell and I hit my eye, the corner of my eye on the, on the corner of a table or it might've even been the teacher's desk. I remember the blood everywhere. I remember the teacher freaking out. I remember getting the stitches put in and I still have the scar. And when I brush my teeth, sometimes I look up in the mirror and I see that scar and I go back to that first grade classroom. And I relive the moment that I received the wound. We all do that. We all have stories to tell people who have had open heart surgery. You know, they marvel at the, the scars that they have that gave them life. Uh, this past Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, I baked a ham with orange marmalade. Delicious. If you want the recipe, let me know. I was cutting the ham and like a, like a doofus, the serrated knife that I was using slipped and cut my finger. Maybe you can see that. Anyway, sliced fillet it. <laughs> and it's like, ah. And I tried for what seemed like an eternity to get the bleeding to stop. And you know, I was starting to get concerned because it wasn't stopping. So my wife just kind of took over and wrapped it up real tight with gauze and put a, a bandage wrap around it. And we went about our business. Well, when I, the people came over and obviously I've got this huge thing on my finger, my thumb, and they ask, oh my gosh, what happened to you? Well, I was slicing the ham and I filleted my thumb. <laughs> and it's the strangest thing. They're, they're like, oh no, that's terrible. Oh my gosh. And the next thing I know, my friend stands up and he says, yeah, you know, right here, I got that caught in a machine once. See that scar? Yeah. There's a story behind every scar that we carry. And if that's true physically, then it must be true emotionally, psychologically, even spiritually. Spiritual wounds can sometimes be the most damaging, the most deep, the deepest of wounds that leave scars. And sometimes those scars don't heal. And that is the ultimate heartbreak for a pastor who tries to convey the unconditional love of God, knowing that there are people who are so wounded by experiences that they've had in church that they can't possibly let go of those negative impressions of the pain that was caused to them. And they can't see God through another pair of lenses because the wounds inside of them haven't been overcome. And two, because they've never heard an alternative. They've never heard a more excellent way. So they just assume that that's their reality. But in truth, scars can heal, even the spiritual scars that people carry, and the emotional ones too. But we have to be willing to take our faith and put it to work and not be afraid to touch our own scars to confront those things that prevent us from living our fullest lives. And we all know what they are, right? Don't need anybody to tell us. We know what they are. But we don't always know how to overcome them. That's where the message of resurrection comes. And once we learn how to live with our scars and our wounds, then we claim a victory over them because our wounds don't define us. That's the key.
to joyful living, making the conscious decision that our wounds will not define who we are, that there are other truths that better tell the story of who we are. But it's a choice that we have to make. I can't make that choice for you, and I don't want you making that choice for me. That's my privilege, and it's also your privilege to name your wounds, but to declare that they don't own you. Just like Jesus told Thomas, you touched them, but that doesn't define my life, nor does it define your faith, Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We touch our wounds so that we can grapple with the, the pain and the reality of them, but we move beyond. And we fight for the hope and the promise that comes from the resurrection message that Jesus gives to his disciples and the blessing that he gives to Thomas. In the midst of all of that, he blesses them with the Holy Spirit and breathes peace on them. That is God's ultimate desire, ultimate goal for all of us. Not that we avoid our pain in life, but that we approach our brokenness, our pain, with courage and with confidence that we're not doing it alone, that we all have victories to claim. And we're here to help each other along. We're here to encourage each other. We're here like the disciples were together in their ministry. We are together in ours. There's no greater gift. So on this first, second Sunday of Eastertide, I wish you the same blessing that Thomas had. I wish you every victory. I wish you courage and strength to overcome the wounds of your life so that you can experience resurrection in all of its mysterious and beautiful ways every single day. Until we meet again, may the risen Christ be with you.
our time together in this sacred space of worship has come to a close. But the good news is there is no time or space that can separate us from the unconditional love of God or the love of Christ that binds us together. If the God who raised Jesus from the dead is for us, who dare be against us? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Return now to your everyday life with humble confidence. There is nothing about to happen that God has not foreseen and no situation where Christ will not be there ahead of you, preparing a place and an opportunity for you. Thanks be to God. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and grant you shalom, true peace. May it be so. Thank you.